What do we do when the world pushes back on us? Really faced uh, much opposition uh, in the first three chapters. Uh, but now, did we really think that that was going to continue? Uh, did we really think that the rulers of this world would just sit by and let the gospel be preached? Uh, the answer is no. The, the world will fight back at every opportunity uh, when we are presenting the gospel for people. Uh, understand that this world does not want people to come to Christ. And so we have to understand that we need to fight against that. We need to keep pushing forward and keep spreading the gospel. So let's go ahead and pray before we open up God's word this morning. Dear Lord, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, this church and this opportunity that you've given me to uh, share, the, share the word with everyone this morning. I pray, Lord, that uh, if there is any here uh, that hear your word and are moved by it, that they would just come to faith in you, Lord. And I, I just pray that that would happen this morning. Uh, I pray that you would give us all boldness uh, when we preach the gospel, Lord. Uh, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, this morning when we discuss what to do when the world pushes back, uh, there's really three things that we need to remember. And I almost, I almost actually split these up into three different sermons, but I decided to go over it all today. So that might scare some people in here this morning, but I promise I won't keep you for too long. It'll only be, you know, two or three o'clock. No, okay. Uh, no, uh, but we have to understand that this pushback, this persecution from the world, it is to be expected. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, also, we should understand that the world cannot stop the gospel. And so no matter what they do in the world, they cannot stop the gospel from being spread. So we have to have that understanding. That should give us comfort. Also, uh, what we need to do when the world pushes back, we need to pray to God for boldness. We pray to God for boldness. And so those are the three things we're going to be going through this morning. First, understanding that the world will push back on us. When we are spreading the gospel... encountered here in the book in Acts chapter 4. Uh, if you go ahead and turn there, I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 4. And remember that this is right after they just healed a lame man and they did it all in the name of Jesus Christ and they are preaching the gospel as a result of this. And a lot of people are coming to know Jesus as their Savior. And so this is what happens as a result of that. Uh, it says, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, uh, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the, the sorry and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about five thousand. And so they're being arrested here for not, not doing the miracles, but for doing them in Jesus' name and preaching the resurrection, right? And so it, we'll see throughout this passage, the thing that the world wants to stop is not all of the Christian service and stuff like we talked about last week. They don't want to stop that. They want, to, they want Christians to keep go, doing good things. Uh, they just want you to, to stop you from sharing the gospel when you do good things. And it's kind of hypocritical. They still want us to do nice things for people, but, uh, but not do them in Jesus' name. And so that's what's happening here with the apostles. So we have to understand that this is to be expected from the world. Uh, the, world the rulers of this world uh, do not want the message of Christ to be preached. Uh, they lose power when we preach Christ, when people turn to Christ, instead of relying on governments and all of this stuff, uh, they lose power over people. See, the rulers of this world are like a dangerous animal. And when a dangerous animal is cornered, it doesn't just cower before you, it will lash out at you. And that is what's happening here. Uh, the further we push the gospel, the further we move forward with the gospel, the more... Our, the enemy will fight back against it. 
trying to discourage us from even talking about Jesus. We can also expect questions uh, from the world. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, it says, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as uh, Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And, went, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? So, you know, they're asking, What power, what authority have you done this? And so questions that we can expect from the world. Uh, these aren't just questions like, how do I come to know Jesus? These aren't good questions. This is interrogation, right? And so the kind of questions that we should expect are questions about our preaching, right? Why are you preaching this? Uh, do, do you really believe what you're preaching? Questions like that. Again, not good questions. The rulers of this world are trying to discourage us. They will question our service. They will question, you know, are you really helping those people by doing that? They'll question that. We see this all over in the world today. As soon as someone does something good, uh, there's people right there ready to say, well, they didn't really have the right motives, right? That's one of the things that they'll question too is our motives with everything. Are they really doing this for the other person? Or are they just doing this to further their own agenda? Or are they doing this to glorify themselves? They will also question the authority by which we preach and serve others. Who, what right do you have to do this? Why aren't, why aren't you just turning, why don't you let the government do that, right? What right do you have? Whose name are you doing this under, right? They will interrogate us with those things. The answer, of course, is the authority of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus sent us to serve others. They don't want to hear that, though. Understand that these questions, this interrogation, this presents opportunity for us. See, we have to change thinking about these things. We have to not be scared when they come at us with because we should see said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so when they were faced with this question, when they were trying to discourage them from preaching, what did Peter do? He started preaching. He said, well, you're going to ask me the, you, by what authority? Well, I'll tell you by what authority. By the authority of Jesus Christ. And then he even throws in there, whom you crucified. Again, you'll notice that he says that a lot in the book of Acts. He points out that they were, in fact, the ones that caused this. So the opportunity here is to call out the rulers of this world for what they are, evil, Right? Also, the opportunity to present the gospel. You see, understand that it wasn't just the Pharisees there. It was also a crowd of people. There was many, many people seeing this spectacle. And so Peter wasn't just talking to them. He was preaching the gospel to everyone that would hear it. 
And so this was a great opportunity for them. So when we get pushback in life, we should understand that that's not just uh, negative towards us because it puts more attention on us. We should see that as an opportunity to then share the gospel. So it's kind of funny. When we get pushback for sharing the gospel, what do we do? We look at it as an opportunity to then share the gospel more, right? So if you hear nothing else in today's message, when the world pushes back on us, we push back harder, right? That's, that's what we do. Uh, and so we also can do this by understanding that regardless of us, regardless of what we do, uh, regardless of what happens to us, the world cannot stop the gospel from being spread. The world cannot stop the gospel. Notice here in these next verses that the Pharisees could not deny the miracle that was done. It's just like for us, they can't deny the actual service that we do in the community. Acts chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And so when we do things in our community, right, they can't deny that good things are being done. They, they simply can't. See, also, they, they notice that Peter and John were uneducated and untrained men, right? So these weren't, these weren't anyone special. They weren't like the Pharisees, right? They, weren't, they, they were untrained and uneducated. And so the only answer that they had for this was they must have been with Jesus, right? And so when the world looks at us, right, as just average people doing awesome things, guess what? There's no other answer for it other than we're saved. We're Christians. We've been with Jesus, right? So they can't deny what was done. They can't deny that miracle. So what do they do? Well, they, they start conspiring amongst themselves, and they decide to forbid, not the miracle, but they decide to forbid the name of Jesus. They forbade the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. It says, when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them it is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it, but so that it spreads no further among the people. Let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in, his, in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak uh, nor at all, or sorry, not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. So again, they didn't command them not to do miracles. Uh, they commanded them not to do them in the name of Jesus, right? So again, they still want them to do these things, but just to stop talking about this Jesus guy, right? They want, the, they want the whole thing about Jesus just to go away, right? Because it threatens their power. This is what happens with us today, in the world today, right? Now, here in America, the name of Jesus isn't forbidden yet. It's going there. If you don't see the signs that it's going there, it is. Uh, teachers can't talk about it in schools, right? That's, already, that's been that, like that for a while. Also, they tried to flood everything with anything but Jesus, right? You'll notice, you know, there's no Disney movies about Christianity, but they do just about any other religion in the world. That's not hardly fair, but... It's just something about Jesus that the world wants to stop. Notice Peter and John's response to this. 
and this should be our response as well. Acts chapter 4, verses 19 through 20. It says, But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, I can't stop preaching Jesus. That's our response, right? Whether you think it's right or not, I can't stop telling people about Jesus. I can't, I can't help but speak about him. Can you imagine having such a good relationship with Jesus in your life that you just can't help but talk about him to people? You know, it sure is easy for people when they're dating someone, they, they tell everybody they know about that person, right? If they really love them. We should have that feeling about Jesus, that we just can't help but tell people about Jesus, regardless of what's happening, right? Also, notice here the people's response. It says in Acts 4, 21 through 22, it says, So when they had further threatened them, talking about the Pharisees threatening them again, because they couldn't really do anything to stop them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them, because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. You see, that's an important thing. So that shows something about Peter and John as well as the people. And notice that the people all glorified God because of what had been done. So Peter and John couldn't be accused because they didn't do this thing in their own name, but they did it in God's name, and they glorified God for what had been done. See, we need to remember to when we're out serving, it, serving in our communities, we need to remember to glorify God and not take credit for it, right? As soon as someone says, wow, I can't believe you did that, good job. It's a, I only did that because of Jesus, right? I only did that because Jesus was allowing me to do it. That actually protects us, too. We need to remember to give Jesus the credit, just like they did. The final thing here this morning, the, this, this is really the big point this morning. What do we do? How do, what do? What do we do when the world confronts us about things? How do we handle it? Do we run away scared? No, absolutely not. We need to turn to prayer in the Lord. We need to pray for boldness. That's what the disciples do here. They, it says that they raised up their voice with one accord. So they all came together to do this. Read Acts 4, uh, 23 through 24, just the first half, and then we'll get into the, the rest afterwards. It says, And being let go... They went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elder, elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said. And so before we get into their prayer, right, there's something to notice here. Does it say that they did it alone? No. You see... We're not supposed to face these things alone. Uh, the the Bible is all about it, the New Testament, right? It's all about having a unified front, right? It says that they raise their voice to God with one accord. So they go to their companions and they prayed together, right? We need to be together on these things. Don't try to just face the things in the world alone. You need that support. If you go alone, you will fail. So that's the first thing. We have to be of one accord in this. Next, the first part of their prayer is acknowledging that God is Lord. And I'll explain that after I read the verse. It says in verse uh, 24, the second half, it says, Lord you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. So the first thing, Lord, you are God. That might sound, you know, kind of self-exclamatory there. 
but acknowledge that God, that our Lord, right, Jesus, is God, right? He has all power. And so when we're getting pushback from the world, understand that that is only because God is allowing that to happen. God has all of the power. He made everything. He created everything. It says, who made the heaven, or sorry, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And so all that's happening to them right now uh, at the time that this is written, God created everyone and he is God over everything still. And so when they're facing persecution, understand that God is still God. He's still in control. And so the first part of our prayer is to acknowledge that God is actually in control of it all. And that should give us peace about things. Also, the next thing that they do is they remember that they were warned of these things in Scripture. And so that's what we need to do as well. We need to remember that we are warned that this type of stuff that is happening today, uh, it was going to happen. We're told that it's going to happen. It should not catch us by surprise. This goes back to my first point that these things are to be expected Verse 25 through 28, it says, Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And so the apostles, they're going all the way back to the Old Testament, right? Right? And they're saying that this stuff that is happening to them right now was all spoken of. So God, you're still in control of everything. God, you knew it was going to happen. God, you're, you have the power over all of this. You warned us of these things. And it says, uh, for truly against your holy servant, uh, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pont Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do, what, sorry, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Again, the only reason why this was happening to them was because God had already determined it to happen ahead of time. These events happen. God sees them way ahead of time and warns us of them. So we should not understand why is this happening? Well, it's happening because it says that it was going to happen. This might sound scary and it might sound like God has it against us, but God has a plan for all of this, right? And all that whole plan leads to the very end where Christ is on the throne and is in, he's already in control of it all, but everything is good at the end. So all of these things have to happen. Uh, the Bible tells us that, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better, right? This has to happen. So how do we, what, what then do we do? The, the, the meat of their prayer right there is that they, instead of being scared by all of these things that happen, right, they ask God for boldness. They ask God for boldness. Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 30. It says, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Lord, grant your servants boldness because of all of this, because you're still in control, Lord. You still have power over everything. Therefore, if you're in control of everything, grant me boldness. Help me to not have that fear to share your word. This is something that I have, struggled with in my past, uh, sharing with people even outside of church, right? Even getting up here, that was a hard for, thing for me to do, still is. 
Every Sunday, I am nervous to get up here. But we need to remember that the remedy for our fears is praying to God for boldness and acknowledging that He's in control and He's, he, it's going to happen. That spreading the gospel, it's going to happen. Do you want to be a part of it? That's the real question. Do you want to be used of God or not? The answer is yes, you do want to be used of God. The last part of this. This is probably one of the most important parts of this. After you pray these things, you have to follow through with it. We don't just wait for God to give us a magic feeling, right? We have to go start doing it, and you will feel like that. Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all fill, filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And so after they prayed, they went and did it. They, it says that they spoke the word of God with boldness. Past tense. It didn't say that we're going to go speak the word with boldness. It says that they did. You see, there's a lot of times where we pray to God for things. And we just sit and wait for God to make things happen. But the reality is, is we, if, if you are praying for boldness, right, you need to go out and be bold. God will give that boldness to you. We don't just go, okay, God, I'm praying for boldness, and I'm just going to wait until I, I feel more bold, and then I'll go out. No, you go out and do it, and you'll get the boldness, right? We all understand what I'm saying, right? Or am I speaking gibberish up here? It's a tough thing to tell people about the gospel. It's a hard thing because we have that natural fear of rejection there. You, do we think it's any harder today than it was at the time of Jesus, right? At the time of these apostles? Do we think it wasn't hard for them? Of course it was hard for them. They actually ha had the real threat of death for sharing the gospel. So for us, you know, we, we don't have that, at least for now. We should be able to go and share Jesus with people. And so the answer for when the, the world pushes back on us, right, for, for preaching the word, for even just being a Christian, being a self-professed Christian, when the world pushes back on us, you pray for boldness and you push back harder. That's the last, again, the thing I want to leave you with this morning. Remember this. When the world pushes back on us, we push harder. You don't give up. God wants you to keep pushing forward. Uh, there's a, a famous quote from uh, one of the Rocky movies, right? Uh, it, being a boxer is not about how hard you can hit, but it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, right? It's probably one of my favorite qu movie quotes of all time. But... It, when we're literally getting all these blows from the world, remember the enemy wants to knock us down, right? You know, he's already lost you, right? Uh, the enemy, when you're saved, he's already lost your soul, right? You, you don't go to hell. So what he wants to do to you after you're saved is to stop you from sharing the gospel. That's what he wants to do. So he says, basically, if I can't have you, I'm going to stop you from sharing with other people. That's what he wants to do. And so you, he's going to throw everything at you. But we can't let that stop us from sharing the gospel. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you, you know, remember, the enemy wants to even stop you from accepting Jesus in the first place. If you're here this morning, you're already overcoming part of those hurdles. You're hearing the word. Know this, that Jesus came and died for your sins on the cross. He rose three days later. He did all of that for you. He did that for your sins. All you have to do is believe that that happened, like the Bible said it did, and repent of your sins. That means to turn away from your sins. If you do that this morning, you'll be saved. I'm going to go ahead and invite the pianist and song leader up. I should have done that a moment ago, but... We'll wait for them. But again, 
if you are not saved this morning. Make that decision. Make that decision. It's the most important decision of your life, and it's for your eternity. Right? I was just talking to someone, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, yesterday, and his dad is dying, and you know he's faced with that mortality right now. He, he's faced with that, you know, thinking about that eternity. The most important decision that he can make is to follow Jesus. It's a very hard thing to do is to trust. But that's precisely what the Bible asks us to do. The only thing that can save us is faith in Jesus. You do that because no works that you do. If you think you're a good person, uh, it's not about what you think. It's about what God thinks. And if you've ever done any sin... You're going to hell because it's bro that hell is justice there. So turn to Jesus. He's already paid the price for you. So all you have to do is accept it. Do that this morning. Pray to God for your salvation.